if you went to your neighbor and said, hey, I'm putting a crew together. <laughs> <laughs> like, you you're, on it? like you're, you probably aren't going to get invited over to dinner again. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if you enroll in my eight-week program. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is up, everybody? Jim to my right. Jim, uh, a lot of notes on the old uh, YouTube comments. You made an appearance in a podcast not long ago, and oh, yeah. a lot of positive feedback. People were like, "Oh, Jim's back! Jim's back!" And I was like, "Eh." And then probably the next one I wasn't on or something like that. Yeah, know. but, I mean, you're back. You're back and forth. I I think will, I'll be back in more often now, I believe. I think so, too, and I am happy about that because I like it when you're here. Thanks, Mark. That's nice. And I think the people <laughs> like it when you're here as well. Thanks. That's nice, people. Um, We're joined by a couple of folks here that you're familiar with, Jim. Yeah. We've got Mike Griffin and, and just Justin Lipska. Mm-hmm. From Vortex Edge, uh, Jim. I don't know if you know this about you, but you like <laughs> to come up <laughs> with some pretty wild topics. Yeah, uh, and we have one of those today. So wild, in fact, that I'm going to basically take this and just hand it off to you because I feel like <laughs> you have a lot of ideas. And I, to me, the uh, I guess what this podcast is titled. Can I say what we're titling it? This one. Please do. Prepping for war on a budget. <laughs> oh, man. It just makes me all giddy hearing it. That. It makes you giddy. And in my head, I'm like, that's impossible. Explain what's on your mind and what we're going to talk about today because I don't think it's possible. I'll take There's nothing. Off. Prepping for war and budget are not, uh, you know, they don't do this. If you're, wa- if you're not watching <laughs> on YouTube, you know, right. they don't mesh. Okay, here's the handoff. Bam, take it. Favorite running back of all time. What do you think? Uh, Barry Sanders. Yeah. Is that yours? That's a good one. I really like Tiki Barber on the Giants. Okay, so I like uh, I'm a I'm a, <laughs> uh, I like Marshawn, man. Oh yeah, he's good. I like he's his, always fun. I like his interviews. His interviews are great. Yeah. So okay, I have my pronouns. Actually, it's a phone, so I'm gonna, I'm going to pull the millennial thing and just you know have a phone out while I'm doing something that's uh, supposed to be my job. So we have Mike and Justin across the table. Now the reason Mike and Justin are here is because well, Mike. Well, both of them actually, I should say for starters, both of them have been at war, uh, in a war zone, doing war-related things in their, in their past, in their previous, uh, in their previous lives before <laughs> Vortex. War uh, stuff. Yeah, war stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> Mike, if you listen to one of our previous kind of actually prepping-related uh, podcasts that went really in-depth into some of the medical stuff... Uh, then you know Mike's background in just sort of all types of medical things. That's that's kind of one thing that gets brought up a lot of times when people are talking about sort of this preparing for war uh, sort of topic. And so he's got a lot of experience there, and he loves gear. And he, he's dedicated a lot of time in his life to learning how to use it at a high level. And then Justin has been part of an elite fighting force, uh, and he's actually had to train with severely limited resources and time uh, at times, other people how to fight in war. Uh, so it's it's very kind of, uh, I think, fitting that these two are here. Now, how did this topic come about? I think that's part of what we can kind of lay the, uh, lay the foundation here for this. I noticed, Mark, because I consume various types of content on YouTube and, and whatever it is, like many people do, many of our listeners, and, and I believe even some of you guys do. And one of the topics that's always intrigued me is the whole societal collapse, fallout, everything goes wrong, suddenly we're at war, you were previously just some regular uh, John Doe, who would go to work and just kind of be an average guy, and now all of a sudden you're a soldier fighting in a war. Your on desk your own. job just got a, a lot more uh, interesting. Yeah, maybe a lot less <laughs> desky too. Yeah, and uh, it's on your own home <laughs> turf, and you know there's it's it's the Red Dawn scenario, right? I mean, people have made movies about it, they've made video games about it. As terrible as it would be, and and I think you know, like this has happened in in other countries for 
I mean, the, it, since the dawn of time, people have invaded other countries and, and suddenly you're at war and you've had a fight. Uh, as terrible as it is, it's also just like this extremely captivating topic, I feel, for so many people. Now, because of that, there are YouTube channels and there's influencers and people and, and like uh, like people that a lot of people look to who talk about this idea of like how to prepare for this sort of thing. And one thing I've noticed is that if you follow along with what different people are saying, it can very quickly add up in terms of cost and time needed to learn how to use a lot of the stuff that people are talking about, learn how to do a lot of the stuff people are talking about. Basically, it becomes a significant investment that would require a, a lot of sacrifice to, you know, maybe what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I don't think this podcast, I want to make sure that people know that this isn't intended to like make fun of people who really have dedicated a lot of time and resources no. to prepping for something like this, some sort of big event, some sort of, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that's, that's not it at all. In fact, you know, I think that a lot of people look at folks who do that and they look um, at that like, oh gosh, I wish that I could be that prepared. But they also understand that there's a lot of, you know, sacrifice and stuff that would go along with it in terms of, you know, hey, on my weekends, I really like to, you know, do other stuff while, you know, I'm not at war. I really enjoy like going for bike rides. And so I may not be able to do that if I'm going to all of a sudden start preparing for war. And well, yeah, Jim, you might be like, oh, I really want that thermal device. And then you're like, oh, but I also really like to eat food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's that, too. So there's the time aspect of it, uh, if you can actually afford some of this stuff. And then there's also, like, what I see all the time. You'll see somebody who's all kitted out on YouTube, and they're like, this is what you need to survive. This is what you need to fight. And I'm adding it up, and I'm it at at least five figures, I mean, oh, many times. Yeah. And so, so it's like, um, I actually went through and I created a list. Like, like I said, if you're into the stuff and if you do it, hey man, free country, you can do it. That's awesome. Oh, I think it is awesome. And when so, I wa when I watch content like that, I'm like, I want to do that. I want that. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. I wish I had that. And and I would feel more prepared if I had those things, Jim. And honestly. I think you do need the like. I don't know where you're. I actually, I still don't know where you're going because I think you need those things to be prepared. Okay. Well, if you well, kind of look at it, uh, the past couple of years it was kind of going on with the world. You had COVID, so that was kind of a, a big spike in some of this. Totally. Um, what's going on right now um, in Eastern Europe? That's kind of a big spike in some of this as well. Yeah. So that just sheds more light on, I guess, the subject. It does. Can so, I bring something? Just like a quick side note. Sure. Up, sure. And then like, I'll get to my uh, very Europe fun list. Like I did that. some maths. Yes. <sighs> and maybe we'll cut this out. Maybe we'll include it. Uh, I find it interesting that I feel like around here in these parts, in the good old USA, <laughs> okay. there <laughs> are people that are like, you shouldn't be able to have these guns. And then in these places where these types of things are happening, Justin, they're like, oh, you can hold a gun. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Well, a lot of people over here who say, oh, you shouldn't be able to have guns, then they also turn around and they look at the people who are fighting in Eastern Europe, like the people of Ukraine, and they're like, we need oh, to yeah, send man, we got to send them some guns. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll tell you how they'll solve their problem. They need some guns. Yeah. We got some extras. We took them from these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was actually a discussion point at one time. Uh, was like we need to confiscate all the guns in the U.S. Solve our, you know, the the perceived issue and uh, give those to Ukraine for uh, recruiting civilians to fight in the war. Like I, that was a, a, you know, maybe not mainstream talking point, but it was at least a talking point that I heard. <laughs> that is, once. That I was is. like, okay, all right, that's a that's a way, that's a way. <laughs> all right. Um, well, okay, so. I guess the one of the questions here is, you know, really, ultimately, if you are somebody who can't quite keep up with like some of the stuff I'm about to list here, what what do you do? Do you do nothing? Are you just doomed, or is there some sort like is it a is it an on off switch? Oh, I can't do that, so it's off, and I'm I'm basically just dead, or is it more of a dimmer switch? I'll call it where there's levels to this thing. Now, I just came up for as an example. I've seen in some videos where people will kit themselves out, and they're giving you an example of like here's what you need to you know fight. And I've got, uh, I, I, I tallied up, and mind you, I was actually quite conservative with my uh, prices here. Don't hold me to this. This was, this was off the top <laughs> of my head and all that stuff. Anyway, okay, AR-15 and AR-15 accessories, mag, sling, optic, you know, let's say about $1,800. Uh, 
Uh, there's setup, there's sight-in, there's training that needs to take place in order to actually become proficient with that. Let's say you got a pistol and pistol accessories, mags, optics, holster, belt, all that sort of stuff. You know, that adds up to maybe like 11, 1200 bucks. You got training with that, setup, sight-in, fitting it all to you. Let's say you get ammunition, 5,000 rounds of 5.56, 5,000 rounds of 9mm. That's actually fairly light, I would say, if you're talking about preparing for war. But, okay, I'm just going to use that as my number. <laughs> uh, total there, you've got yourself around, oh, upwards, over three grand. I'd say you're approaching four grand. I've got 2,500 bucks for 5.56, 1,300 for, for 9mm, uh, picking like reasonably middle-of-the-road ammo. Armor, let's say you get a carrier and some special threat plates, 600 bucks for that. You got to set it up, get it all fit to you. You got to do all the research, figure out what you need, get the size right, all that stuff. Kind of seems light, but yeah. Oh, you're, I know. Like I will be yeah. honest, you're pretty conservative on I'm these being numbers. very conservative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm looking, I, yeah. I went around online and I was like, oh, okay, I know there's like nicer stuff in this, but I'll just say, again, like, let's say yeah. we got like the more lower tier yeah. stuff. Okay. Definitely doable. Uh, but let's say you get a ballistic helmet, fourteen hundred bucks. You get med gear. I was so basic with my med gear, Mike, and <laughs> I, I know so you almost threw up when I, I told so you. <laughs> like like I'm talking getting you a tourniquet and some wound packing dead. stuff, like a hundred bucks. <laughs> basically dead. Let's say you get. Uh, <laughs> He'll buy you some time to say goodbye. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, night vision went for a set of dual tubes with the uh, oh, RNVG <laughs> housing. I didn't go with a. I didn't go with the cheaper PVS fourteen. But, you know, Ooh. eight grand there. There's a lot Splurged. of training that you... I didn't even mention the training that you'd have to do for all the med stuff. Mike's been yeah. doing this for years and years and years and years and years, and he still learns stuff, you know, all the time that's med-related. He's been in remote areas of the world. I mean, all that stuff. Um, okay, it just keeps going. You got night vision accessories, mounts, IR laser, other stuff, like over three grand probably. Com setup. People talk about comms a lot and having, like, the headset, the push-to-talk, the radio... Uh, not only is that stuff like, let's see, you went middle of the road there and went fifteen hundred bucks for that. You have to have training. You got to learn how to do it. You got to get licensing in order to train legally. You know, let's say you get your ham radio. Uh, you got to set it all up, make it work with your kit. Get a good pack, tools to work on all the stuff that I've mentioned. I just have an every all the other stuff because I just got sick of making this list. But it's like <laughs> survival gear, boots, GPS, cold weather gear, food, water setup, batteries, lights, spare parts, storage solutions. Also, of course, everyone knows you got to beef up your 4x4 in order to survive the end <laughs> time. Transportation. So, I mean, I just added that all up and I was just kind of, I don't know, I'll just throw 10 grand at that. So the total that I came up with on my conservative and tossed together list was $32,700 worth of stuff. And that didn't include, of course, your training budget. You're likely going to need more ammo if you are training. And then time to set everything up, learn, research how to use it all. You're going to have to have shipping if you're getting all that shipped to your house. Like, this stuff just keeps adding and adding and adding. Uh, if you want to learn how to do all that stuff, like, say goodbye to all of your weekends and free time, too, <laughs> for, like, the next I don't know how long. So the reason I go through that list is because, you know, I'm thinking to myself, all right, if that's what I need to do to prepare for war, if that's what I absolutely need, I'm doomed. <laughs> Because well, it's particularly just, Jim, because you would start on the four by four, and then you'd go, uh, <laughs> and then I'd be like, "Oh shoot, I'm out of money." I blew, <laughs> I blew my budget. <laughs> right, right. Uh, even if you have the money to afford all of it, it's just it's mind blowing. I tried, I tried getting into the comm stuff. I have like very basic knowledge, and I kind of have like basic equipment and stuff like that. Well, we talked, so, we did a podcast yep. on it, and and it was really cool. But here's so here's my one thing with the comms part, like. The other people have to have comms yeah, you that complement your comms. Oh, everything yeah. I listed was to outfit one person. Right. Like, so, my radio does no good if you're like, yeah, I don't got one of those. Hey, buddy, yeah, we're just going to still need to use light signals. And you're like, well, I'm going to carry it because I got it. Right. <laughs> are, um, we, are we doing the Navy SEAL hand signals or the Air Force hand signals? I don't signals? know those. Or the Army hand signals. Oh, okay. Wait, they're all different? <laughs> That's a line from a movie. <laughs> I don't remember the movie. But. I don't remember oh, the movie. Oh, okay. I hope of course. <laughs> The med stuff too. I just get queasy at the thought of in general. So like, I I have an issue. I think you'd get over it real quick in like a real situation. I mean, in a real situation, you'd have to get over it, and so therefore, but I need to train in order to be able to do it in a real. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a lot. Of, anyway. Okay. Hey, did you? I don't think you had thermal on your list. 
I didn't have thermal on my list, but there you go, another. Well, here's grand. so here's one thing that I've heard. You guys, maybe I mentioned this on the previous podcast, but I heard it. You know, probably watching one of these videos, Jim, that you're kind of going. Uh, it's like if you if you don't have thermal, then you're like not even in the fight. There was definitely a talk about night vision. If you don't have night vision, I think thermal is starting to gain the same sort of argument. What I kind of ran into a couple of the last deployments I was on was the combatants, the enemy we were fighting, started to gain those night vision capabilities. Mm. So if you guys have an IR laser, for example, basically it's just like a neon sign saying, hey, shoot here. Um, so we were starting to transition to passive aiming and then also thermals. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So, all right, guys. I, I went on a diatribe there, I realized. But I had to set the I, stage It's important. For this. You got to have the, the baseline. Set the stage. So in your guys' experience, I mean, the thing is, like having been at war and having a lot of knowledge of the gear and stuff that's that's involved and used in battle, what, I, there's so many people out there, and in, in, you know, we're talking to a lot of people in the USA who have a lot of freedoms to get a lot of this stuff, right? Um, there's a lot of people out there who just aren't going to be able to, they can't afford it, they don't have the time to learn how to do it. Like, what is the bare minimum that's going to allow you to be in the fight and actually have a chance at making it you know and and i don't know doing what you gotta do survive basically in, well you just kind of touched on it right there so the basic human needs to survive uh besides that um some of the bare minimums i've seen would be a firearm and maybe a couple magazines of ammunition that's it <laughs> right yeah, and the ability to, like, resupply that yeah. perpetually, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, if you have, let's say, three 30-round magazines and a rifle. You're not going to last very long. Um, <laughs> like, you might expend that in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't have the ability to resupply that, even if you're like, okay, like, I I expended three magazines and I, <laughs> I'm out. Uh, like, if you don't have some place to go that you can resupply that, um you're kind of done. Like now you got to figure out some way to feed that gun uh, elsewhere. I mean, it's kind of like feeding yourself. Like that mm -hmm. need is perpetual. Look at every like conflict or war we've been in. Like logistically, there's a huge backside support that's going on yeah. that people don't even consider. Right. Uh, the supply chains, the support, logistics, all of that comes into play. Right. Um, invading a country takes a lot of that back work. Um, not only that, but sustaining that fight, like Mike was saying. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, logistics as a whole are a huge thing. You know, I mean, um, I think a lot of times people think like, oh, I'm going to exist, you know, as that soldier of one or whatever. Um, and the reality is like you can't carry enough stuff to kind of be a perpetual combatant. Like mm -hmm. you have got to have either logistical support that you set up for yourself that you're able to go back and get or you're going to have to, you know, source that stuff from somewhere else. Um, even if you just stick to the basics. So like if you were to wear civilian clothes, um, and you had, you know, a single firearm, uh, you know, magazines are a consumable item in the sense that over time they'll wear out, like the parts of the gun are a consumable item. They will eventually wear out. Um, and ammo is obviously a very consumable <laughs> item. Um, you know, it, it is one time use unless you're going to pick up brass and reload it, which maybe not the best tactic in a, you know, combat area. Um, and so you have to have a supply of that stuff. And it's amazing. It was amazing to me how quickly like stuff ran out, um, when I was first deployed because mm. it, the amount of time it takes to get something and you think you've thought of everything. Um, and that's not on an individual level. It's on like a team level. Um, like I had a, a guy that, uh, the castle nut on his, uh, carbine, uh, came undone and the detent, uh, and spring fell out oh, and yeah. like that gun is deadlined. Okay, man, like you get, uh, an AK now until we can find one of those, uh, you know, spring and detents to fix that rifle. And, you know, like that's a part that costs, I don't know, less than a dollar or the two parts together cost less than a dollar. Yeah. Um, and so having, you know, basic supplies like that, um, and that's not even talking about like night vision. Right. Or like oh, an expensive yeah. radio or plate carrier, you know. But I always think like, you know, Bob's gun shop, that probably actually is a real store. Somewhere. Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. Uh, any, pick any shop Shout that you can have in the Bob's world. That I, yeah. 
There's any shop you can have in the world, you put Bob's in front of it, it exists. <laughs> yeah. Right. Bob's skateboard shop, Bob's whatever, sh- Bob's headset shop, Bob, you know. Right. But like, might not be open, you know, might Probably not have not. regular hours, might be gone, might be uh, looted, you know? I mean, like. Yeah. And to have those supply chains, say you have tens of thousands of rounds, say people who are like, oh, I'm, I'm good to go. I, I have all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe in the garage or they're, you know, shut out back. They have tens of thousands of rounds. How do you transport that? How do you yeah. transport it? And it, I mean, it, and let's say your neighborhood gets invaded, at, like in Red Dawn when they all come in on parachutes and, you know, and you have to get going. It's like, well, now I'm leaving <laughs> 9,000, you know, 500 rounds behind or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Uh, that kind of sucks, and you can't really go back to that. But like you kind of, you kind of both alluded to one thing. You can talked about this like army of one or something that I think a lot of people get the idea of in their head. And it's easy to do when you watch movies like John Wick or something where the <laughs> dude literally is an army of one. He goes and he just like just mows down yeah. untold numbers of bad dudes, right? Um, but I think that's what everybody thinks that they're going to be, and everybody wants to be. But. Uh, a very, I'd say, unrealistic, very difficult to be able to do. Ju- Justin, one time we were in the office talking about the fact that you on your team. I mean, and we're talking about we're talking about a team of elite level soldiers who have tons of training, tons of battle experience, all this stuff. You each had a sp- kind of specified role within that team, Absolutely. right? Not everybody was this master of all trades. You yeah. had a guy to go to if this went wrong and yep. a guy to go to if that went wrong. Um, and that's on like, that's on like the top of the top <laughs> teams out there. So if you think that like in addition to your day job and your family life that you're all of a sudden going to also with the sliver of time you have left over or if you manage to find a way to not need sleep <laughs> become greater than that I, it's just hard yeah. to think about. um jack of all trades master of none everybody's kind of heard that phrase um you can invest a lot of time say in communications but then maybe your medical starts to fall off or maybe yeah. you're really medical heavy now your proficiency in i don't know maybe uh firearms or weapons kind of goes down so um there's that kind of give and take so when you assign like individual roles and responsibilities um it kind of spreads that load and then you have that subject matter expert Mm -hmm. which really aids in basically uh the capability of that unit yeah the more i've thought about this the more i've personally come to the conclusion like you're not doing it on your own no a lot of people mention that in our in our prepper podcast we first did, we were just kind yeah. of like pontificating on stuff. They were like, yo, you need a team. You need a yeah. squad. You need a team. You need a squad. And and I think, you know, looking at some current events and things like that, I think you need to plan on their I, – I think the only way it works is you is if you have government support, it, you know, with that <laughs> supply chain, with that – you know what I mean? Like, hey, guys, it's a little bit uh, – we got a problem here. We're going to need some help. But, like – you well, know, when you, they don't, that's the only people that I know that have an infrastructure in that. Yeah, in go, place. government level yeah. money. Well, that's just right. it. <laughs> money, level like, money, government we were level talking resources. about uh, <laughs> prepping for one a budget. I guess one of the uh, the pros I had was uh, the budget aspect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because um, when we were like even. <laughs> Justin's uh, crew was like, wait, wait, wait. wait. Thank, <laughs> define budget. Thank you, taxpayer. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's y'all's budget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, but even like little things, so it was our budget for, um, team internal and then maybe like our partner force. So say you're spending, um, money, uh, to, you know, outfit your partner force with a quarter of a million rounds for one weapon system. You're like, well, that adds up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, well, I looked up a little stat before the podcast, Jim, Yeah, this, this may or not be accurate. I was kind of Googling around trying to find like, oh, what, what is like our annual, you know, kind of defense budget. The number that I got, which may or may not be correct, but it was a large number, <laughs> was two point zero one trillion. Yeah, mm-hmm. that sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, now, when you think, I actually like, thought it was closer to four, but and it might be like it, it fluctuates. <laughs> um, let's just say that is the number, though. Then I was like, oh, zero one. So then, like, you know, trillion. That's like a big number. So I was like, well, what's what's point what's point zero one of a trillion? That's ten billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to put that number with the populace of the United States right now, 
that'd be kind of interesting per individual. <laughs> like yeah. what it would cost to, or what you could do with that amount of money to, um, like, gonna, yeah, to right. outfit, outfit now, 330 obviously, million people. Obviously, like, oh, we need, I don't know, like uh, a tank, uh, a plane, uh, yeah. a jet, like, or missiles, things right. like that. I mean, that kind of skews the number a little bit. <laughs> now, the the wild thing about all this is, right, and and there, there's a lot of layers to what I'm about to say, right? This is a whole onion, like an ogre. Uh, <laughs> I can't ever cut an onion without thinking about the movie Shrek. Um, okay, there's a lot of layers to what I'm about to bring up, but like, we were at war in the Middle East for 20 plus odd years. Well, we were at the middle. We were in the Middle East before that, even too. So, it, like, but we were at war for a long time there, fighting against a force that you want to talk about war on a budget. I mean, we're talking about most of the people we fought against were in sandals, whatever their street clothes were, an AK, and I don't even know if the magazines were full or not, but they maybe had a couple on them. And versus our gigantic fighting force with this huge budget, and that lasted that long, and it you know kind of fizzled out in the end. Now, part of the layers that obviously you need to bring into this is like a lot more of them fell uh, than we did. Uh, so, you know, certainly... There's something to be said there. Uh, the training and a lot of the resources that we have behind our force certainly helped keep a lot of soldiers alive. Um, but, like, the idea that you need all that if in, in order to avoid just getting completely mowed down or just having your country basically go from being a, a free country to suddenly occupied by some communist, you know, overlord in, like, a week is kind of, you know, I don't know if that's the case. Because we've seen that. And, and we've seen, you know, over in Eastern Europe, you have a big giant fighting force coming in and then a lot of people suddenly being, you know, turned into soldiers and fighting off a large fighting force again with minimal resources and all that. Um, I don't think it's a great spot to be in where all of a sudden you're just sort of like, I don't have anything. Somebody give me anything and I'll just, yeah. you know, I'll run at the bad guys. But... There's, I just think there's something to be said there. Well, you kind of alluded to it. Um, everybody um, kind of touched on it already is the resources, right? Um, I feel like what made them such a like, um, formidable force was the resourcefulness of those individuals mm -hmm. and those groups. Um, the resourcefulness that we saw was, was pretty incredible. Um, what they would do, what they would kind of uh, rig together, um, some of the imp well, improvised explosive device, right? Yeah. The IEDs, they're just that, improvised. Um, and they would never would have got to that level. Um, and um, being, uh, I guess, prolific as they were, as if they weren't resourceful. Mm -hmm. um, they were very resourceful. I mean, I feel like some of the greatest engineers are born when their country is occupied <laughs> by a fighting force and they need to try and fight back. In an, I mean, we look at the French during World War II when they were occupied by Germany and you have some of these like basement guns being made and all this other stuff, like wild things. You need, and you have, you know, even unfortunately what's been the bad guys against us, you have some of those people in the Middle East and stuff like that. I mean, it's just people's ingenuity has to go up. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a, it's a wild thought to think about like what is the bare minimum that one needs in order to be able to fight off bad guys in a war situation yeah, I mean, I still think it goes back to, as an individual, I mean, I, I said this on a previous podcast, like, knowledge is power, and it weighs very little, right? And so, like, even understanding concepts of things, and then learning to use what you have, you know, I think sets you up for success. So maybe if you look to the conflict um, in Eastern Europe right now, like watching people that had never handled a firearm before get handed a wooden, you know, model of an AK and like, okay, we're going to do small unit tactics with this. You just say bang whenever you want to shoot. <laughs> um, and, uh, and like, that's their introduction to fighting. But, um, you know, being resource limited does make you forces you to either be creative or fail. And seeing some of the stuff that people came up with is, is, you know, pretty impressive. I mean, even in that conflict, you look at 
um, the use of off-the-shelf drones and uh, relatively inexpensive munitions that have been turned into pretty capable devices that if we were to like send off and have one made would probably cost a hundred times as much versus like, Hey, I'm going to go buy, you know, a DJI, whatever drone, and I'm going to figure out a way to release something by turning the lights on and off, uh, on the drone. And it, it might drop a, you know, med kit, or it's probably going to drop like a frag grenade, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, make that out of something that's very, very inexpensive. But if you like have, you know, knowledge of those skills ahead of time like hey i know how to fly a drone because i used to be like a person interested in photography and then adapting that skill to the current conflict like um you know i think that's uh, a, res- a level of resourcefulness that is available to anybody mm-hmm. right you know i mean it doesn't cost a lot of money to be good at some sort of technical skill right i mean i don't think i'm saying anything that that people really don't agree with here but it's so much more important to know how to use a few things that you own rather than uh, than to own everything and really not know how to use any of it. You know what I mean? I mean, you think about situations where, oh gosh, I've been getting a little bit more into golf this summer season, right? And you see these videos and everybody wants to see, like, what does it look like when a pro-level PGA tour player plays with the cheapest set of golf clubs on Amazon. What do you think it looks like? They can freaking smack yeah. it way <laughs> so better than like anybody problem. else can. You know what I mean? What does it look like if you give a professional race car driver a Yugo? They can probably thrash your butt <laughs> in a Mustang GT. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, knowing how to do something well can, uh, it can make up for lack of resources. And like you said, I mean, the knowledge is power. Um, I mean, and, and Justin, you kind of went into outfitting your your partner forces that you had overseas. Mike, you guys outfitted partner forces and security and stuff like that where you were too, right? Yeah, so the teams that I worked on, the first team I had the most involvement in like kind of the day-to-day logistics and outfitting guys and getting them trained up. Um, later on, the leadership teams were larger. And so we had like, okay, like, more by having more people in the leadership team more people could kind of specialize and be like Mm -hmm. okay man like you're kind of the quartermaster and you're taking care of that that stuff um on my first team we basically had like me and three other dudes and yeah a hundred uh 120 guards and so we issued those guys you know like boots pants shirts plate carriers plates helmets etc um they got a locally or it was purchased in country AK and a uh, fistful of magazines and ammo. And, you know, we would take them out to the range, get them qualified, do ongoing training. We did med training for them, did like how to use the radio. And that's the thing. Justin's hoping, Justin's right now, he's hoping that none of the guys that were on his partner force are listening. <laughs> Cause they're like, where was all that stuff for us? <laughs> yeah. Pretty, that's how, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but, um, it is funny. We were talking earlier, and you were like, man, I bet those guys thought they were just being rained on with gear. And it was interesting to, like, okay, man, you know, it's, it's maybe like spring in Iraq. All right. And here's all of your gear because you're new to the team. Like you just, you and 50 of your, you know, buddies just showed up. And here's all of your gear that you're going to be issued. And it would be like cold weather gear. <laughs> and it's like, bro, it's 90 degrees outside. You don't need to wear your fleece. But they're like really happy to have that piece of gear. Oh, right. And it's like, no, like I'm going to have to mandate what you cannot wear. <laughs> you're going to get dehydrated. Uh, because you'll, you will <laughs> become a heat casualty because they're so like happy to have all this cool stuff. Um, but it goes back to the talking point about like it kind of takes a team or a community to make this happen. So the guys didn't have to be um, like they wouldn't have passed like an amateur radio test. Right. Right. But they understood when I would go over like how to use a radio with them. Like, hey, here's what the PTT is. Here's how to swap a battery out. Here's how to select the channel that you're on. Um, here's how to do a basic like radio report of like, uh, you know, talk or you this is me uh this is what i'm trying to communicate in a concise manner you know like um direction you know what the event is 
uh, et cetera, distance, all of those things. Like they didn't like, have to like, know. Like, no, you hang up first. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> they didn't have to know like how the radio worked in the sense of like radio theory, but they needed to understand like, okay, I press the button down, I wait for a fraction of a second, and then I start talking, that sort of thing. And, you know, mm. like, what do I do if the radio doesn't work? You know, like, how to problem solve it's that issue. And kind know. of interesting you bring that up, um, because individuals don't know what they don't know. Right. So um, you may have a group of individuals who may be on that level. At the same time, you may have another group of individuals who really aren't 100% positive how a firearm actually works um, with firing that projectile. Case in point, say maybe an individual was linking 50 caliber rounds. <laughs> um, and in order to, I mean, they're pretty big rounds and there's a little bit of friction with the links. So in order to get them on there, maybe that person didn't understand how primers worked. Um, so when you're hitting oh no. a 50 cal round, all right, with the projectile, all right, against the primer to try to get it seated in the links, that individual explodes that, 50 cal round in their hand yeah so no, you I have that. that level of individual trying to train them versus trying to train up a person of like oh we're going to send like a situational report via radio <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so it's really interesting on where they're at um kind of yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's got yeah there has to be at least a baseline established yeah of well some sort. and thinking of or taking what you just said into consideration in this scenario, right? Like, even if, if you're the person who's gone through the process of being, say, like, more prepared than a lot of the people that are around you, you're going to need the people, you're going to need the help of the people, of a lot of these people who aren't prepared, and, and you might be having to become the teacher, you know? Mm -hmm, and, yeah. again, take into consideration, you know, people, you don't know what you don't know. Like, it could be completely foreign concepts. You know, I mean, I can think of... You know, I, I doubt, you know, most of my neighbors know how a cartridge works. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. But those people might end up being on your side real quick. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of, it's one of those things like we talk about, like, what is the bare minimum? And I don't even know if you can really get at ex an exact yeah. bare minimum. It's going to change on who you are, where you yeah. are, what's going on. Well. You know, I, you need to have some means of, of protecting yourself, some means of survival, some means of fixing yourself. And uh, oh, look at oh you! Oh my gosh, hey, party Old foul! School. I know. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mark's, I turned it on. Mark's I, phone my phone rang, off. and then I, I, okay, I lost my phone earlier today, and so then I turned the ringer on afterwards because I was worried right. about, and then that's that's what happened. Right. <laughs> you know, you're over forty when you keep your phone on loud all the time. I haven't had my phone Just ringer on it. in years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, we're right. So, you know, you have to have some means of like protecting yourself. You have to have kind of the things I was talking about, but also you have to know how to use it. You gotta, you gotta understand if I have a guy who shows up, let's say, you know, Mark, we're, we'll start a camp. Uh, Justin and Mike can be part of it. They probably actually even know more than us, but probably us four, we've got, a, <laughs> us four, we've got a, a camp going here and you know, we're, we're a task force. <laughs> Some guy I'm, I'm showing up with rocks and <laughs> how do you make this work? <laughs> uh, yeah. Mark doesn't get to mess with the 50 cal. Um, but like some other guy shows up, let's say, and he shows up looking like a dude fresh out of whatever is the latest awesome one man versus everybody's special ops. I'm a Navy SEAL ranger operator, whatever. Um, and he just looks amazing. He's got all the right stuff, highest end, doesn't know how to use any of it. I'm going to be like, hey, um, you can cook food. Like <laughs> we, In fact, actually let us just use it because it's just it, your liability at that point. And hopefully like you he have can too cook. much stuff and, and no idea how to use any of it. It's just like, it's just kind of a mess. I'd rather just specialize in a few important things involving protecting myself, keeping myself alive. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, what, well, what more is there? <laughs> you think about that individual who has, say, uh, a good portion of your list. They're like, okay, well, I'll just do battlefield recovery at that point. Um, so if I need it, I can, you know, recover it, you know, um, via the enemy. 
you know. Sure. Um, but say they're not like, what do you mean? What do you battlefield mean? recovery. He's not so. referring to asking the bad guys for something. Like, you no. sort of have to <laughs> wait. <laughs> until, <laughs> you have to wait a, a until they're on the ground. So they, they don't need it anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Right. He's, he's taking a nap. They're sleeping. So, but say um, <laughs> that uh, item that I am recovering um, isn't what I'm utilizing, right? Maybe it's, you know, this um, AK, and I've never touched an AK because I, you know, hate the AK platform and I'm just strictly AR guy. Well, I mean, if you have a basic understanding of say like the eight cycles of operation, you could probably get that firearm into employment. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, so going back to like the knowledge is power thing, even if we did want to do battlefield recovery, um, a lot of people out there, um, maybe might not know how to drive us manual. <laughs> yeah. All mm -hmm. right. So I'm going to, Oh, I'm going to use their vehicles if mine goes down. Okay, cool. Uh, the only vehicle available right now is a stick. <laughs> Can you drive a stick? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, same with the radios. Okay, I'm used to this radio where I just push the button and I talk. Well, cool. Now I have that, you know, those other platforms of communications. Do I have a basic understanding? How do I apply that? You know who's, so, you know what you need to be? You know what the minimum requirement <laughs> is? You need to be a farmer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, You're that's not wrong. just it. You're not wrong. They're resourceful. Dude, they know, like, they can fix anything with that. It's like, oh, the combine is broken. I got a clothesline hanger. Uh, I've got, you know, a chip clip and I, some rope fixed. <laughs> Done. I got a stick welder in the garage that I've been using for the last 65 years on this farm. Done. You know, like they just figure out how to make anything work. It's, no, you're it's right. being I mean, resourceful. The resourcefulness yeah. is yeah. And strong there. We were talking about this down at Edge before we came up here, like... And this has just been a, like every now and then I'll just research different stuff. Um, the concept of the Minuteman uh, has always been of interest to me. And if you think about it, like, you know, a lot of them uh, it, back in the day, they were farmers because they had to feed themselves mm -hmm. or they had other, you know, technical jobs in the community. But almost everybody would hunt in order to put food on the table. And like that skill of shooting was a thing that you know, was necessary for combat. And so it was just like this thing that every, not everybody, but a lot of people already knew. And then, okay, they had a certain level of physical fitness that they were able to, because they had, you know, difficult day jobs. Uh, you know, it was just part of their survival. Um, and then it was just, okay, uh, we're going to ask you to be ready to go, uh, you know, in a relatively short time frame of notice. And you didn't have a ton of equipment, but you had the ability to feed yourself you were clothed, you know, you had the ability to give, obtain water and you could probably do what was reasonable for first aid at the, at the mm -hmm. time. You but, probably understood how to be outdoors. Yeah. The like general you had, area. You know, basic land nav skills, you know, you had the ability, which is probably the best ability is the ability to improvise. Mm -hmm. And it was born out of necessity because I mean, every day you had to improvise, right? Yeah. You know, like you were kind of forced into that role regardless. That's just it, and that that's where I think the disconnect happens with people when they just think about, like, buying new stuff for this, right? So, like, I want to prepare for war. I need to buy a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, that's that's one of those things where a lot of, a lot of skills that you really actually need are, like you said, Mike, I think you hit the nail on the head. They're born out of necessity, and they're, they're born out of, uh, they're born out of, I don't have the money or whatever it is that I need in order to do this job perfectly, maybe as it was originally manufactured or intended. And so therefore, I need to figure out what is needed in order to get my end result done. And so like, we live in a time now where people like, there's such instant gratification, they're not always willing to like figure stuff out. It's almost like, you really don't need a huge budget. Time is one of the things that you need, and I think a lot of people fill up their time in their, in their given day with just so much stuff. It doesn't allow them, and that's why we like instant gratification, because we're like, I don't have time for that. Just like, I'll buy it. I don't have time for that. I'll just, uh, whatever. But, you know, if you kind of more almost just simplify your life a little bit, and you just start trying to force yourself into some creative, critical thinking situations, um, well, that's, that's huge. And a lot of them don't require a huge budget in terms of money. Um, but can be extremely useful in the scenarios like we're talking about. 
but like the skills, some of the skills that you guys are talking about there is like, oh, you know, like, well, I need to feed myself and my family. So hunting is part of what I have to do to do that. Like the general population doesn't do that anymore. Like, true. Yeah. like, yeah. like most people just don't have that skill anymore. They don't need it. Right. So it's like, cool, discard. I will fill my time and learn these things because I, maybe I do need these to survive and, you know, today's yeah. day and age. Well, right? and you know what? Actually, it goes back to one of the things that, okay, say your time really is precious. You don't have a whole lot of it and you don't have a, a whole bunch of money. What you can do is to get a whole bunch of good buddies that are going to be on your squad, <laughs> on your task force. Yeah. Because Mark, what I'm thinking is you hunt way more than I do. As much as I think hunting is cool, there are other things in my life that I mm-hmm. do enjoy more. We've talked about this before. <laughs> but like if we're on the same squad, and you and and now we're really even going back to times before you know the modern era and cities and all that stuff. If you and I are in the same squad, you go hunting. I'm like, you know what? Mark's a really great hunter. I feel confident that he's going to go out and he's going to get us some food while he's out doing that. I'll fix stuff. You'll be doing some A team type stuff. I'll be I'll be making us a van. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll be welding up I like, like twelve in mini fourteens. Right. Exactly. To blast at the feet of bad guys. But like, you know, I can do that. And then we can rely on Justin to be overwatch for us. Oh, and basically anyone within a thousand yards is gonna get zerped. And then Mike, if any of us gets hurt, can come over and fix it. You know, so it's like that's where Mike I got zerped. <laughs> like it's it's it seems it seems more and more like the ultimate well, answer is to Create a squad and stop trying to be this one man wrecking crew. You're actually going exactly where I was, I guess, being led mentally. And I really want to get your guys' take on it. But that's what I was like, you know, we're talking about being prepared. Do you actually have to, uh, like, get your crew and be like, hey, these this is my skill set. Maybe these are things that I'm working on. You know, Jim, you're awesome at mechanic stuff fantastic vehicle breaks down guess what jim that you know that's your job like you said justin's on overwatch you know mike's patching dudes up um but then also in today's day and age like if you went to your neighbor and said hey i'm putting a crew together like <laughs> <laughs> you want you're to be on it? like you're you probably aren't going to get invited over to dinner again <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if you enroll in my eight-week program, <laughs> <laughs> um, like people are like, "Oh, that's that's the tinfoil hat weird dude prepper soldier of fortune," right? And you know, hopefully not. I mean, but I think you have to have some people skills, though, right? Like you, <laughs> like, right your, like maybe don't lead. maybe don't like. Hey, hey, I'm new to the neighborhood. Get to I think I you want to be part of my gang. <laughs> I don't. I don't <laughs> care how. Like two years later, I, I, you could be like just having yeah. general pleasantries for yeah. two years. I think the second you bring that up, well, so I'm sure everybody un- unless this. unless it's a like minded person, they're like, did we just become best friends? Well, that's like, just it. I mean, you in, in the garage. Yeah, you take the uh, <laughs> you take the long approach to see if they are that kind of person. If they're not, then you uh, well maybe. But everybody at this table, I'm sure, has thought about that. When that's true. if something goes down, right, like. It hits the fan, like, where are you going? Who are you, like, Yeah. everybody's probably thought about that already. It's so, true. But also. But I would say, I'd say, yeah, maybe, like, in this room, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but. I don't think you have to be quite, so, I mean, maybe at some point it needs to be more explicit. But, but like, my neighbors know You're that, crazy. you know, my wife and I work. <laughs> Oh, wow. Wow. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> Wait, what did he say? Crazy. <laughs> You're like, You're a um, guy. Like, I, the majority of our neighbors know that, like, my wife and I work in the healthcare field. Some of them know that I'm in the, you know, firearms realm. But most of them, at a minimum, know, like, oh, hey, you know, Mike and his wife have some background in medicine. So if something goes wrong... Um, like that's a resource that they may be thinking about. Like I know that one of my neighbors has a long background in construction. And so if there was, if something occurred, you know, in the, let's just say it's not war, but it's a disaster. Yeah. And I needed somebody to give me a hand to like patch up a hole in my roof from a storm. Then like, that's the resource that I'm going to go to and be like, Hey man, uh, can you, can you give me some advice or a hand in patching up 
uh, you know, this hole in, in the house. And the more you get to know the people that are around you, the more that you know what they're capable of and their resources, their, their mental um, or knowledge-based resources are. And, you know, maybe you venture down that road of like, hey, uh, you know, times are a little crazy right now. Do you ever give any thought to, you know, having a little extra food on hand or whatever? I honestly think it's an easier conversation to have. Maybe you don't start out. It was funny to get the email for this prepping for war on a budget. Um, you know, it's been on, been on my outlook for a while. At Vortex, but, you can just send that email. That's hey, normal. bro, you want to prep for war on a budget? Uh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm down. Yeah. But... You know, I Honestly, think I thought it was a required co- course from HR, and then I found <laughs> out we were podcasting. But but if you kind of think about that, that happens on a much larger scale, like networking. Yeah. Right. Um, so, for example, when you brought up our the war, you know, for the past twenty some years, right? We've been in the Middle East. Like the U.S. wasn't on that alone, right? Yeah. We had staging points yep. um, for like invasions and things like that. So there was a lot of networking worldwide that took place that people might not oh, realize yeah. either. We were mm-hmm. getting our guys in planes were getting calls from British guys asking them to drop bombs, just like they were getting yeah. calls from you yeah. know U.S. guys on the ground. Like that, you know, they there was crews, yeah. and I mean, even you you look at just the fact, like our military in general is just. Yeah. I mean, we recruit soldiers to come and fight, and there's different branches, and the different branches are kind of like you know, the army's on the ground, and they're like, yo, I mean, they got planes of their own too, but the army's on the ground, and they're like, yo, dude in an F-15, <laughs> I could use a missile right there, and dude in F-15 is like. You got it, brother. Absolutely. I mean, our partner force in when I was deployed in Afghanistan, they were from Eastern Europe. <laughs> that was our partner force there. So it's um, kind of intriguing. And uh, if you think like big picture wise, like all the networking that has to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, if you have a skill, like knowing how to teach that skill, I think is really important because maybe you don't convince your neighbor ahead of time to like be a part of your gang, right? But maybe there's, uh, or your squad, uh, but maybe Some there's squad. a compelling argument when yeah. something goes down that, oh, you hey, point. man, uh, you should, like, come with me if you want to live. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I think that's a line in a movie. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and then you're able to say, you know, hey, I've got an extra rifle or two. I will teach you how to shoot as long as you help me out. And I, you know, I I think being able to, uh, like, educate somebody else in the skills that you know is really important. And some people kind of go through their professional careers and they never are expected to teach the thing that they know. Like, they are taught the thing, they go to work, they do the thing, and then they go home. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a, a practice skill to be able to teach somebody what you know, to know the things that are high yield and important versus the things that are kind of minutia and uh, less important. Um, but the ability to get somebody up and ready to go in a short time frame, um, like I'm talking all about this, and Justin's probably the, uh, the authority at the table <laughs> on that. But, I mean, that was, you know, your job, right? Yeah. Um, and so the ability to, like, A, do that and have the resources to do that, um, you know, fairly quickly ready to execute. Well, you kind of touched on it. A uh, big thing that we kind of did was building rapport. Um, so, like, your neighbor, for example, uh, probably won't be willing to help or aid you in any way if you didn't have that rapport from the get-go. Mm. Um, same thing with our partner forces. We had to establish that rapport. Um, just because you're an American doesn't mean they're going to listen to you, <laughs> right? right? So um, there's a lot of give and take there, too. Yeah. Gosh, you know, there's pros and cons to it all. I mean, it, because you know, a lot of people I know, because of the way things are today, uh, they're like, why? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to have my neighbor on my squad. You know, like uh, that person. <laughs> they wouldn't they bother me, me. They wouldn't let they me put a fence mow, up. They never mow their lawn. <laughs> uh, I can't stand that. Guy. You know, and so they're kind of. That's. I think so many people they get so they get so turned off on other people really easily nowadays. I think it's because we can be so self reliant in today's day and age. I mean, it used to be back in. Uh, it really wasn't even that long ago, if you look in history, that people really were reliant on their neighborhood and their and their local people that were around them. And they would see all of each other as family, even if you didn't really like each other that much. But it's kind of like, I mean, hey, we got to either do this or nothing else. But right now, we're, we got so like, we're, we got so, like, but soft. We're, sup- no, we're super reliant 
but we're not reliant on our community. Right. Right. And so it's it's made us like soft, but in a really like kind of tough exterior kind of way. Isolated. You know? Isolated kind of way. And a little you know, like a little bit grouchy hermit kind of way. Well and like, so that's why everyone wants to be kind of this like So if you are prepping for war, it's probably not gonna be overseas. It's probably gonna be on your front lawn, mm-hmm. I would imagine. Yeah. Kind of what we're talking probably. about. Probably most of the people I think who yeah. are be listening to this, that's yeah. kind of the point of this. Yeah. yeah. So if your front lawn is gonna be your neighbor's front lawn. It's so whether you like it or not, they're involved on some level. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and you know, even if it's like Mima lives across the street. I mean, there was videos <laughs> out from the early part of the uh, you know recent conflict that like entire towns got together and made Molotov cocktails. I mean, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of skill to do that, but it's a thing that needs to be done, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if you're gonna try and repel uh, tanks coming through your village and so maybe the you know Mima across the street isn't going to take a, a <laughs> rifle and fight shoulder to shoulder with you but like she can collect intel and watch you know the comings and goings mm-hmm. while you're grabbing some sleep that sort of thing i mean i sew up your xyz or whatever it is yeah. going on for decades even Darn in the u.s look what happened in world war ii like all the uh i guess uh, industrial production kind of shifted in the U.S. kind of during that time, mm-hmm. right? Uh, ammunition yeah. factories kept popping up and things like that. Uh, resources kind of got diverted. So, Where's the Riveter? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, that's another thing. I guess a lot of people who haven't uh, worked in that environment, they don't realize all the stuff that needs to be done. And it there isn't always like, yeah, I'm going to go down to the Walmart. Or I'm going to Amazon Prime it. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be like, like there'd be a lot of rude awakenings if this did happen <laughs> where people are like, oh, crap, we need this. And they go on their phone and they're like, oh, wh- oh, my phone doesn't work. Oh, wait, yeah. I don't, ha- there is no Amazon. Oh, wait, there is no. Well, that's, what, that's oh, where wait, I was going with that no... earlier comment. Like, we're like, and I, and I inclu- include myself in this, but like completely and like utterly reliant on these systems that we've developed over time. Uh, depend on them, take them for granted, and then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. There's not, there's yeah. Maybe there's not food at the grocery well, store. People are like, you know, oh, but- I'm just going to reload ammunition at home. I'm use my digital scale and I'm gonna plug it into the wall. There's no power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Now we're using what's that? What's that one thing that you had, Jim? The oh, the reloader that ha- where you use like a hammer and a little scoop. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that you just awesome. fill the where casing up to the top, yeah. right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. how you measure your charge. Yeah. Out. yeah you can <laughs> you can reload like 308 literally with a hammer. <laughs> I don't remember it's where that is. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I did it right here actually, yeah, and it's the reason this little mark is on the table. It's been <laughs> I always I always like run my finger over it in every episode. Um, but yeah, I you know, and and of course we, we're kind of talking about the way that people are nowadays, and it's kind of like, oh, I don't like my neighbor; he never he didn't let me put a fence up or what. And <laughs> and you do think like a lot of times, uh, it's sort of the the same situation where I think all that stuff goes away real quick. Too. It goes away real quick, but it certainly would Hopefully. be better if you already had the rapport to begin yeah. with. You know, you don't want to yeah. necessarily be like, oh, there's there's Russians or whatever. Uh, falling from the sky right now and in parachutes and that you know like hey now let's shake hands and try and figure out you know how to be buddies here well not only that but then, like all of a sudden you're like you know you guys are in the thick of it and he's like ditches you and he's like remember that fence <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I bet you wish you had it now <laughs> uh, but you know so there's that and it's like uh, gosh I can't remember what I was getting at well but, if you look at 9-11 that's pretty much what happened then mm-hmm. Like everybody was like trying to put all that stuff to the side, but like you said, is it too late at that point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think people people do that a lot. Where I mean, you look at sports and you think uh, the U.S. Olympic team, right? The let's say the U.S. Olympic basketball team, something made up of a bunch of dudes from other teams who never really played together all season, and then they get tossed on the same team. And they get tossed with some other coach that probably maybe only one of them has ever been coached by before. And, I mean, usually those guys tend to do pretty well. Maybe the basketball isn't a great example because basketball is kind of, I don't know, like there is an element of learning how to work with each other. But it's it's a sport. You know, you've done it the same way for your whole life. But, you know, then like people who rooted for XYZ player on one team and then, you know, other people who rooted for another player on the rival team, they can get together because like, well, now our guys are on the same team yeah. and this is the U.S. So, like that does happen, but... You know, I think, anyway, I'm kind of on a diatribe here, but, like, if the rapport was established earlier, I think it would be better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I think we're at least alluding to earlier you working with um, 
some folks that maybe you were helping prepare for war on a budget, like limited type yeah. resources. Like, what does that baseline? It's tricky because you, 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 it sounds like you guys did have that larger infrastructure. We can go backing over what you were doing. The equipment they actually had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the equipment that uh, they had um, eternal, like internally. So whatever they were outfitted with, with their country, their military's country. Um, they had vehicles. So in this case, Toyota Hilux pickup trucks. Um, they had. I'm convinced Toyota Hilux <laughs> pickup trucks actually just apparate from like the ground <laughs> in in third world countries and stuff. Like they just sort of like appear. They worked extremely well. Hey, do you follow the Instagram page? I think it's Toyotas of War. <laughs> no, but that sounds awesome. Yeah. It's something like that, yeah, and it is. I think it's. Follow. I think. Yeah. I think Hiluxes are like manna in the desert in the Bible, where it is like <laughs> sometimes God is like, "You people look like you could use some help. Here's some Hiluxes." <laughs> 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 anyway, sorry. So they had those. Oh, uh, they had those. So they had their transportation. Um, they uh, had clothing, just regular like tops, bottoms, nothing, nothing crazy, and, and boots. Um, as like, well as their like firearm. quotation mark, like combat clothing or just um, like they had clothes? Uh, I would say combat clothing. But okay. it was literally uh, like a long sleeve shirt and pants, pants that were the same color. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> that's, that's about it. Matching's important. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but besides that, uh, in their rifle with maybe three to five magazines, like Mike said, that may or may not have worked. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Hopefully they were full. Yeah. And then uh, an AK that, again, may or may not have worked. <laughs> um, okay. Besides that, we that's what we had to work with, I guess. Um, I don't want to say work with, but um, that's the material that we had to fall in on. So we would bring in, like, basic stuff to kind of sustain them as an individual, such as um, maybe, like, uh, I guess – kind of those human needs, right? Mm-hmm. So whether it was uh, protection from the elements, um, maybe like a sleeping system, um, you know, um, gets a little cold in the desert at night. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, like maybe uh, something to hold their ammunition with. So maybe like a belt, some magazine, holsters, pouches, things like that. Canteen, water bottle, what have you. And mm-hmm. that was basically the gear that we had, um, as well as maybe a ballistic helmet. Um it would get to about 1.30 in the heat of the day. <laughs> so if we did issue ballistic armor, uh, it would have been worn for maybe like that initial uh, shock and awe, what, maybe a week or so, and then that would be put to the side. Mm. Um, Do you ever have guys put like cardboard or uh, magazines in their plate carriers so they look like they have plates <laughs> on? We did not. My guys did that. We did not issue. That was like a thing we had to inspect. Really? Like, Yo, dog. Yeah. You or excuse me you got your stuff in Um, (laughs) hardware works (laughs) Um, and then uh, we basically supplied uh, the ammunition and then the training Um, so ammunition would be upwards of probably for like maybe um, a partner force of say 30 individuals um, maybe 250,000 rounds um, and I would say that yeah, you guys went in uh, on ammo. Yeah, I put five thousand <laughs> rounds of five, five, six, and nine mil, and you're probably sitting there like, that's going to get you through one of my training <laughs> Justin's sessions. Justin's like per week. How big of a team was that? Uh, about thirty individuals. Thirty. Okay. Um, so. so that would be on the light side. Um, I can't remember the numbers that we had to kind of forecast, but that was all brought in on the front end. Uh-huh. So if we came in with the ammunition, that was the ammunition we had for say six months. Mm-hmm. So anything we brought in, six months. <laughs> um, and then after that, it was so pretty basic stuff. If you guys want to kind of think about it as a whole, transportation or excuse me, transportation, um, basically life sustaining items, um, firearm and ammunition. Um, then it was just training from there on out. So say six months, maybe the first two months were all training, mm-hmm. uh, and the last three months were maybe patrols. Uh, with intermittent training sprinkled in there as well. And yeah. then what was the atmosphere of like? this you know this this fighting force that you are supplementing with some equipment and training like were they integrating with you guys or was that hey here's your training now go do your thing and we w- there was luck. integration involved yep okay so um and then also obviously um if you have <laughs> kind of the way we approach it like on uh some of our shooting classes down at edge um if you perform a certain drill with a certain set of equipment and they're looking at you and they have maybe less than ideal like firearm 
go ahead and shoot that drill with their firearm and be like, yeah, it can be done. It's same thing. So, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. If you show up and you've got the you've got yeah. the thirty five hundred dollar AR and all the nicest ammo that you're shooting, in a sweet optic and lasers. Yeah, and then the guy with a <laughs> with a bent AK. Is like, <laughs> <laughs> so hey. going back to that rapport building, right? So we would be like, all right. Um, we would also have uh, some foreign weapons that we would bring in and kind of train with them. They'd be like, okay, yeah, you can see us like training you shooting this weapon. All right. Okay, now we're going to go back to what we want to do. <laughs> right. um, but uh, a lot of it was probably the rapport building for the first, you know, initial portion. That was um, that was the thing that I always heard about the uh, the uh, fighting force that you were a part of, Justin, was that there is an incredible ability to create, like, infrastructure and do training and get, like, other people spun up on the I mean that's like a lot of what you your group was like good at yeah absolutely uh, I mean which is huge I mean that's another one of those things is like you guys could have gone in because you're very well trained and very good at fighting and stuff like that and like done work but you force multiplied yourself which I think is kind of one of those words that gets overused but anyway but, that's uh, honestly uh, what we were considering I mean you literally yeah. did you force multiplied yourself by yep. being like hey my squad of I don't know how many guys you had let's say like 20 could, could do some serious work here or yeah. I could take 30 extra guys or like a couple crews of 30 extra guys and now we've got a big yeah. old honking crew and we can do even more work. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yep. Um we do didn't, you think we, that do you think that translates over to like this domestic just I honestly think it does. You kind of train the trainer like Jim said like force multiply. <laughs> That's kind of the whole um I mean look at uh Mike touched on it earlier um France, right? Kind of did mm-hmm. the same thing there. Um, that's honestly how my unit came to be the OSS in France. I mean, (laughs) I like, you hate to say it, but (laughs) ISIS. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what they did. I mean, the thing uh, you kind of mentioned, it it was sort of like you step on a cockroach, you turn off the lights, you turn on the lights and there's a hundred more cockroaches. And you're like, (laughs) I'm the human here. I have all the, I have raid bug (laughs) killer, but like somehow. Yeah. You just like, they just keep coming. (laughs) Um, and that, that's, frustrating to an opposing force is you know when you yeah. when you're the force that they're fighting <laughs> keeps multiplying you know and it's like if you're this one man army that's really awesome maybe you take down a bunch of bad guys with you but eventually there's like a hellfire missile headed your way and if it hits you then yeah. your little army of one is done and yeah. phew, cease to exist off the face of or the planet. just four bad guys you yeah. Know? yeah like yeah. i mean at right. some point you gotta sleep right <laughs> or, yeah or like, a bad guy that's just better than you yeah. Well, if you look at like conventional units in the military, um, they would have like a combat load kind of going uh, to what you were alluding to earlier with your round count. Right. So a combat load would be what? Seven magazines, uh, 210 rounds. Um, and then also they had like, um, uh, I guess for um, enemy, um, I guess, uh, ratio. Uh, I think it was one to three, something like that. Three to one um, is kind of where uh, they were OK with uh, conventional wise. Um, so you have to think about that aspect as well. Mm-hmm. I think the training aspect of it is obviously very important. I mean, we, we've got you two here, Vortex Edge. Vortex is training entity here at Vortex. We put on some awesome classes and pistol, carbine, long range, night vision, uh, hunting as well, hunter marksmanship. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we do at Vortex Edge. Just check it out. Um, so the training is very important, certainly learning how to use what you do have. Now, that was one of the things that I kind of <laughs> went into is if, of course, you go out and you buy the whole catalog uh add to card everything on palmetto state army add to card everything <laughs> in midway usa add to card whatever it is um then you probably have a little bit more training yet to do but i mean if you just hit hit the basics and you just learn how to use a firearm use it well and you know then that can be employed to protect yourself i mean what do you guys say this is this is probably going to come across as like a gag me with a spoon type thing because I'm asking people who work for a specific training entity to tell me what to look for in training. But I think the thing you have to realize is that like these guys realize that they can't, they don't have, we don't have the bandwidth here to train every single person in the United States. You know what I mean? Like it's just, you're going to have, there's going to be other trainers out there, other trainers that are really good who can put on training for you as well. Um, but like what does somebody look for in the training that they take? The people say all the time, like get out and train and then they go and they just like shoot groups. For on the individual basis is the willingness um so if you're even talking about war kind of like mark said earlier you have that neighbor and it just starts running away the willingness isn't there yeah. sure um so i would say willingness is going to go um 
quite a long ways. What about, so like, what should someone look for? I'm sorry, in terms of like, okay, I want to go take a class because I want to learn how to like shoot my AR better yeah. or whatever. Like what kind of stuff in terms of the classes that they're looking into? Or like what, what type of, maybe if it's not even that they're going to take class, but they're going to do their own training. Like what kind of stuff is important? Yeah, so I'll answer that from my perspective. And this is, like I've started out taking what I would term more like tactical classes. And I look back kind of on my path through firearms training, and I look at like the next generation of shooters that come through. And I kind of wish I had had somebody to put me on the course of more like, you know, competitive style shooting hmm. early. And then I could, and then have somebody introduce me. Competitive shooting in a war podcast. So here, here's my, <laughs> here, so here's, many here's my, like, <laughs> is that. <laughs> Like if you build your foundation from that standpoint and then you specialize, because to me, that's like a foundational thing. Like, can you shoot accurately? Can you, do you have good gun handling skills? Um, you know, can you be safe with at like a subconscious level? Like mm-hmm. safety should always be uh, something that's on the mind, but can you divert to uh, functioning safely with a firearm? You know, the, the gun handling component, um, you know, like basic marksmanship, like all of that stuff just kind of can run in the background. And then you can apply, uh, you can go and take that tactical class and you're not like trying to learn the tactical component and trying to learn how to shoot straight. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. As opposed to like, Hey, you're going to show up to a fighting class and you have to learn how to shoot straight while also learning, you know, all the tactical stuff. Right. And, I think, you know, shooting from the performance side is a good way to build that foundation so that you can do that stuff. And then if you want to learn the, you know, context specific tactics, um, that is, a, you know, like a, one path that you can take. Yeah. But if you just start out like going down the tactic side, then um, your foundation, you know, it may take a little bit longer to develop. Yeah. Basically, I'm not saying that you are wrong for going and taking that tactical class because that might be your sole motivation. Like you may ne- never have any interest in competing. Um, and when I started like taking training, I didn't like I knew that um, action pistol stuff was a thing, but it was not an interest mm-hmm. of mine. And I very much was like I used to be the guy that was like, uh, like, I don't I, like I think that's you're making it a game and. But I see the value in developing the foundation of your firearms handling skill and your ability to like perform on demand in that space. And then you can apply it to the war component or the combat, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, the combat component, whatever, the fighting with that tool component. And the, you're not having to like consciously think about the skills that you're trying to apply. You can focus on the environment. I Absolutely. would have to agree with Mike on that. Um, speed and accuracy, um, <laughs> um, whether you're in a hunting situation, uh, you know, combat situation, competitive situation, it, it, both of those are always on the table, right? Um, so that needs to be taken and into it's, consideration. It's the same skills. Yeah. It's yeah, just that absolutely. the context that it's within yeah. is yeah. different. So one thing I like about competition is it, values those two components but not only that it also adds problem solving into the equation mm-hmm. yeah um so, problem solving and pressure yeah yeah and not only that but like you said stress right that is a little bit more stressful versus someone maybe just going to the range and be like okay yep i can hit 10x every time on that bullseye yeah right um okay now let's add a couple more layers to that like jimmy's onion <laughs> right so yeah. um i also what? i think sometimes like okay uh let's talk about like small unit tactics or CQB and people want to like jump into the deep end of that stuff. And they're maybe not, they haven't refined those individual skills, like individual shooter skills. Well, you can refine your individual skills with a lot of, like there's a lot of opportunity to get feedback. If you kind of take that path of, um, competitive style or performance based shooting, right? In the sense that like I can go and immediately be shown 
that I did something wrong. If I were, even if you don't go and shoot a match, let's just say that you go and shoot like some standardized skills on the range and you videotape yourself. Okay. Like I put myself on a timer and I shot this standardized skill that, you know, occurs out in the world, uh, you know, on the internet. And I sized myself up against somebody else. And I realized like, Hey, I could work on these three things. It gives me something to go and work on as opposed to like, that I can do as an individual, as opposed to, all right, man, I'm going to get together with like four dudes and I'm going to go and do CQB. And I won't see those four dudes again for like a month. I can't work on CQB with those other guys until we get together again, Mm -hmm. but I can work on the individual shooting skills and maybe I can work on some of the other stuff. Like it gives you a lot of opportunity. And I would say that when I think back to like, you know, early reporting out of uh, the current conflict that we're seeing in Eastern Europe and that person being handed, you know, either a real gun or an airsoft gun or a wooden, uh, you know, fake gun. And the guy's being interviewed like, yeah, man, I was a graphic artist last week and now (laughs) I'm being, uh, you know, I have volunteered to defend my country. Mm -hmm. Like, I bet that guy wish that somebody had spent, you know, even two months showing him some fundamental skills And then he went and like shot a handful of drills versus like, Hey man, the, they're literally on the doorstep. Here's your thing, uh, to, uh, go do a small unit tactic tactics drill. And you have no basic marksmanship training. Like I personally think that that should be like mandatory. Like I think, I think like just a life skill that you should have as a, no, like it should be taught in school. It should be taught in school. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, like I oh, mean, and like, it is. Oh, you're 18. Here's your two months of uh, training. This is how you know yeah. you shoot a firearm. This is how it goes bang. Don't point it at this guy or well, anybody. And, <laughs> yeah, basically. And, yeah, and it is funny, you know, Mike. You bring up the people who want to just jump right into the deep end on CQB and 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 stuff. You know, small unit tactics and things. And so many of those people, the reason they want to do that is because they're like, like if you if I'm just gonna word it in a specific way, they're like, I want to be moving dynamically with a firearm. I would like to be doing that at some level of rapidness. I would like to find myself in a situation where I'm coming around a corner and I'm raising my gun and I'm shooting and I have to put shots on accurately and, you know, I have to, like, take, you know, maybe some sort of, like, rules of engagement into account, whatever it is. And if you think about that, it's like, I just described actually a competition You state. just <laughs> decide. Yeah, but, just, yep, exactly. But, you know, if you... If you apply that to the CQB, like the differences may be okay. I'm I'm in a stack, and so you know, and and the other difference is like the target might shoot back, and there's a bad guy. So now, like if I had the competition side of things down, I have the whole moving dynamic with a firearm, taking my safety off, making it. You know, I have all that down. It's just now I actually that's almost become a, a subconscious thing, mm-hmm. or at least less of a conscious thing. And now I get to focus on the tactics side, and so it's just it's so true what you were saying. And I mean, it, but it's funny because. Those same people will look at competitive shooting and be like, yawn, I just want to do the cool stuff like CQB. And it's like, a lot of the stuff that you think is cool about the CQB is actually the competitive shooting part. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that makes it CQB that's not the like fun run and gun part is kind of boring. If you think about it, CQB essentially could be considered as a USPSA stage, for example, without, <laughs> With you, opposition. W- yeah, without <laughs> you walking the stage first. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It, it, but it's just, you know, it's like, yeah. I mean, anybody who says it doesn't apply, it's like, do you think that a cop w- who's learning a pit maneuver with their pursuit vehicle would be better if they've never driven before? And we're like, now we're going to teach you how to drive and do a pit maneuver at the same time. <laughs> or if they were like a kid who grew up doing go karts and who grew up doing like dirt oval track racing and all that other stuff, and motocross and all that other stuff. Like, do you think that that person's then going to get in a cop car and be a little bit better probably at performing a pit maneuver? You know, absolutely stinking lootly. Yes, yeah, dude, 100%. I mean, so when, it's when, funny. When Mike was saying that, I was like, yep, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. When I've... I've done very limited competitive shooting gym, and and this goes back to uh, how do you want to spend your time, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I hear you. I hear you. So Tr- like, I totally get you that. You know, I if I'm gonna if I have spare time, I'm gonna hunt and fish, right? You're gonna work on cars or yeah, but you, get, you put yourself something. in some unique situations with hunting and fishing. But anyway, well, and so I'll get there <laughs> as well. But um, yeah, you you watch like a like a multi gun match or something like that, where I mean, it's like it's it's footwork. It's like uh. 
improvise rests or things like that. You know, when mm-hmm. we did that PRS uh, match, it's like, yeah. oh, now you have this rest. Now you can shoot like this. Shooting off of oh, a rock, now a conex. Yeah, sh- shooting, yeah, rock, conex. Oh, now you have to shoot between these stairs. These are actually all situations that could potentially yeah. come up. And w- if you've been there before, like, it helps out a lot. You're like, oh, I remember... Uh, you just kind of, like you said, it's, it's subconscious. Like, well, I know what I'm going to do in this situation. Like, yeah. these things are happening over here. This is you're kind of like all these, all this input is coming in. And you're like, yep, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to shoot from here and I'm going to do it like this. The gun part's taken care of. Now yeah. I can just think about the yeah, like bad guy part. Open right. up some bandwidth to think about all the other stuff that you need to think about instead yeah. of like having to think about, all right, it's time to take my safety off. Oh, I really need to, you know, do this with my trigger. Oh, I really need to think about what I'm doing with my sights. You know that sort of thing. Like now, that stuff kind of happens. And yep. now, that being said, I will say something that will probably make the diehard competitive shooters, uh, you know, maybe a little upset. Is that like if you want to prepare to go to war or be like a value added in a combat type situation, you need to kind of be a generalist. You can't only be the guy that can shoot really fast and accurate. You also need to be able to like land land nav. You need to be able to communicate. Oh, mm-hmm. You need to be able to like work as a part of a team. You need to be able to lead. You would need you to say, be led. Would you say, like, Mike, that you may also need to be in shape enough to move more than twenty five yards before yeah. taking an hour break? Yep. It would <laughs> be agree. you know, it would benefit you to be able to do self aid and buddy aid. Like there's a pretty long list of skills. And so sometimes I can remember like working with a particular competitive shooter and he was like, yeah, I just don't understand why X, Y, Z doesn't know how to shoot better. And I'm like, yeah, I get it, man. Like, like that guy gets paid to carry a gun. He should shoot better. Absolutely. He also has a lot of other stuff that he's responsible for. And you only have to be good at shooting in order to like, you know, fulfill that job title. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yes, you still need to put the effort in to be good at shooting. But if you want to be well-rounded for that thing, you, you should divide your time up against some of those other skill sets. And yeah. I don't mean you need to understand, um, like at the level of a communication sergeant, uh, radio theory, but maybe you know how to like turn a radio on. <laughs> Cho- mm-hmm. Choose a frequency, not a channel, but a frequency, uh, for two radios and hand a radio to another guy and be like, Hey man, if you need to call me, like use this. Um, similarly, like all the, like, okay, go out and do some basic land nav, like play a little geocache game, um, and get a little bit of land nav, both GPS and map and compass, like find other activities that will make you well-rounded for that stuff. And that kind of ties it back into being on a budget. Like maybe go out and do the activity and then decide what you need to buy (laughs) instead of buying this stuff Uh, and tell yourself like, hey, I'm going to do this activity one day and you never, ever get to it. Right. Like go out and do the activity. You know, maybe you use your phone to go and do your first geocache and then you realize like, oh, man, you know, like here's the limitations or what if my phone didn't work? You know, like I lost cell service or whatever. And well, how, what gear would I need to do that? And you're already like involved in the activity um, before you buy the gear instead of buying the gear with the plan to get involved in the activity. Does that make sense? You get better at an activity if there was a period of time where you had to improvise before you bought the nice stuff too. But I mean, hey, preparing for war on a budget, Mark, what I've gathered is Get the bare necessities in terms of like have a gun, have a lot of ammo, and uh, maybe have a you know a few accessories for that. You got to get an optic, of course, for any firearm that you have. Uh, <laughs> get some friends who maybe know other stuff than you. Mm-hmm. Shoot some competitions, and also uh, be a farmer. Be a farmer, <laughs> um, yeah. or try some things that uh, bring you outside of your comfort zone, but force you to use critical thinking. Um, and do those things and then figure out maybe later on what it is that you have to buy in order to do them better. But well, uh, it's just... Uh, and and you did bring up the fitness thing, which I know I could be uh, a lot better at, Jim. But, um, oh, yeah, fitness is cheap, dude. It, I like, mean... It, go out and it, run on the road. Descartes. Time and effort. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, time, effort, discipline. Yeah. Um, uh, you don't and need, then, of you course... You don't need a gym membership. Right. Like, you, can, you can body weight yourself to fitness. Yeah. I mean, then, of course, too, the other thing is, if you have all the time and you got a bunch of money, 
and you want to spend whatever it was, like 35 grand or something that I came up with, you want to do all that, get the nods, get the thermal, get the best gun, get all that stuff. That's awesome. You know, I think just like we've talked about, there's a lot of other considerations that you should probably take into account as well. Um, because, uh, I mean, you could probably force multiply yourself. Well, <laughs> there we go. We're using that word a lot. Uh, I think that's I like, like that's one of those things where um, I can't remember. I, just, I feel like a bunch of military guys right now are probably making a drinking game out of us saying that. <laughs> or, uh, or they're rolling their eyes every time that we say it. But make yourself better than just an army of one that could just get wiped out, you know, by some odd happenstance and then gone. Uh, make yourself bigger. Well, than think that. of yeah. like, I mean, we're talking about budget here, like creating, you know, potentially a lot more of, you know, quotation mark use that you're not hopefully having to fund. Yeah. Right. Uh, now you got a lot more resources. A lot of the things that we've mentioned have been cheap in terms of money, but if you, like, there's no way that you can ever do anything and have it, like, there's no free lunch. You know what they say? Like, yeah. that old yeah. phrase, right? There's nothing that you can actually do that's genuinely free. Because we've discussed a lot of things that are cheap in terms of money, but making friends takes time. Yep. Going yep. out and, you know, shooting competitions takes time. Training and learning how to use your gear better takes time. Uh, so, you know, certainly you can save money in that regard. Or if you don't have a lot of time, you can spend a lot of money. But just know, like we said, that there are other things to take into account. But just there's no such thing as as preparing for war <laughs> genuinely all around <laughs> cheaply. Um, yeah. Uh, remember that video we watched, Jim? <laughs> remember that video we watched about how to kill a hung-up gobbler? <laughs> I yeah. feel like this yeah. has been the preparing for war on a budget Oh, uh, because at the end we just say there's no such thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean... If if you if people are out there are interested, but you shouldn't be, uh, Google how to kill a hung up gobbler. Maybe this video will come up. I can't up. find the video. It's I. It was like I swear it was twenty minutes long, and the guy would say the same thing, and he would almost get to the point, and then like just go right back to square <laughs> one. It was like I'm gonna tell y'all how to how to get a hung up gobbler. You know, sometimes you got a turkey, it hangs up about 70, 80 yards. He kept saying that hung seventy, up. eighty yards. You yep. get a hung up gobbler. <laughs> he goes, "This is one trick I've found." that'll make sure to bring them in that 70, 80 yards. See, because when they get out at 70, 80 yards and they're just hung up there, it can be difficult. So I have this one trick. I came up with this one trick <laughs> about five years ago, and when I did, I had a turkey hung up 70, 80 yards. <laughs> and see, the problem, and this was the 20 minutes of we didn't. We actually didn't we never, never found out. out. We never found oh, out. We didn't get the secret. Just a cliffhanger. It's true. I don't know if the video just ended or if we ended. I think we I think we gave up. We did. We didn't uh, hit that point today, did we? I hope not. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I, think, I think so. we because this is a difficult. It's a good conversation. Yeah, I a, love this conversation. I tell you what. I mean, I've got some solid takeaways though. You know, as far as like how you should how good ways to potentially every situation is going to be different. Like, you, but things you might want to be thinking about. I'm pretty and stoked honestly, for our squad. Well, I was going to say, I'm just yeah. glad you guys are on my squad. So I will say, like, we talked about this in the med podcast, like, make good decisions regardless of what happens, right? And so, like, is it ever really a bad decision to get to know the people in your community a little bit better? No, not really. Is it a bad decision to, like, learn how to handle firearms safely at a reasonable level? Like, do you need to go out and be a GM-level USPSA shooter and a national champion three-gun shooter to be valuable at war? No. But if you learn how to have, you know, like basic competency with firearms and a, at a safe level, and then you take it a little bit further, it's not going to be a bad decision. You know, I mean, it, it won't cost you $100,000 to accomplish that task. Yeah. It shouldn't. You know, if you get out and do more activities in the outside world, like a byproduct of like, let's say we go out and do more activities in, in the, you know, outdoors, A, it's probably better for your health. <laughs> right than like sitting around the house and b unless it, it's a day like today yeah. unless it's a day like today <laughs> going outside is like Canada. breathing a fire yeah uh literally just sucking the smoke right off the top of a campfire it's I particularly did, did, bad I today i wasn't gonna let me let it hold me down last night jim i got it was like 8 30 i'm like i threw 40 pounds on my back and I, I did like three miles around the neighborhood that's way like, to go you also have the equivalent of like two years of secondhand smoke i have black lung right yeah. <laughs> anyway sorry Mike. so like none of those things really have 
significant consequences other than, you know, you're giving up time that you could put into something else. But, you know, I think if you got up and went for a, a walk on a regular basis, uh, particularly if you threw a pack on, like that's not a bad thing to do. You know, there's really no like consequence to that as long as you look both ways before you cross the road, you know, that type mm-hmm. of thing. I did. But, um, <laughs> you know, just like, so come up with your list of things that are probably good for you regardless, right? And yeah. that's the the easiest way to allocate your time uh, and your financial resources. And even if war never comes, uh, and hopefully it, you know, doesn't uh, come to the, to the U.S., but those skills are good for you if a disaster happens. I mean, mm-hmm. like, there's, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, et cetera, that happens Fires. every year. <laughs> Fires uh, that happens every year. And it may not be that you have to, like, go out and, you know, defend your community, but you might have to pack your family up and leave your community for a little while in order to get away from some natural occurring disaster or that sort of thing. And all of those things, like being able to function with a map, being able to communicate with people, be able to provide for your own security, like all that stuff is good outside of war as well. So just make good decisions, stuff that'll apply, whether, you know, you were in the position of somebody uh, you know, during World War II um, or the current conflict in Eastern Europe, like, you know, uh, all of those things are probably a net positive for you, I guess, mm-hmm. at that point. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm glad we got there, Mike, and thank you for that, because that's going to be my key takeaway from all this is being proficient with basic competencies, because yeah. you can do that on a budget. It is super beneficial. It'll likely come in handy at some point like you said, whether, you know, what we're describing here uh, happens or not. And you're sure as heck going to be a step ahead if it does. Yeah. Yeah. And you will be kind of a jack of, you know what I mean? So you're going to be able to flex with the situation and, and likely be able to hopefully get through a lot of stuff. Um, and and frankly, it's it's um, those are things you can do on a budget. Yeah. And it's a lot less overwhelming. Like when I watch those videos, which are awesome, Jim, where it's like envy this and all the things, it's all it's like it's overwhelming. It's unrealistic. It's paralyzing. Right? You're like, well, I guess I can't <laughs> you know, just give up, can't do that. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like what Mike was yeah. saying or what you guys have been saying, you know, build those basic competencies and Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's Agreed. my takeaway. There's it there it is. That's my takeaway. I really like that. Good takeaway. I listed mine out earlier. Jay? I'm going to go back. Remember, remember of, of what, what, what do we call it? Last thoughts? Last call? Oh, yeah. We well, used to do that. Well, I can't remember. We're kind of doing that again. We're doing that. <laughs> Jay, what is, what's, your, um, what's your last call? That old cliche that everybody said it a million times and people kind of roll their eyes. Like, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, the best laid plan kind of goes out the window, like as soon as the bullets start flying. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you're going to revert back to what you've been exposed to. Um, so touching on the point Mike said, like kind of expose yourself to those uh, certain uh, aspects that get you outside your comfort zone. Because when like the fan, that's what you're going to revert back to is what you know or what you can apply um, with what you've been exposed to, to how that could fit your situation. Yeah. I like it. That's and don't forget, advice. if all you ever do in life is fly drones, then we could maybe use you on our squad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I need to learn how to fly a drone. That's yeah. another takeaway. <laughs> or just find a buddy who flies drones. Oh, MC Ryan flies drones. Actually, MC Ryan does a lot. He does, he's on the team. Flight. He's on. <laughs> we already know that we want MC Ryan. Actually, quite professional. <laughs> there is a rare occurrence where you have that person in life who can be a one-man wrecking crew. Not everybody can. MC Ryan can. <laughs> He's our own in-house John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm All liking right. it. I That was one of my favorite podcasts that we've done. I enjoyed it. It definitely made me think. Um, Jim, close it out. You opened her up. Close her well, out. Well, <laughs> <laughs> usually we say something like, you know, let us know what you think. I'm sure there may be some people who are like, look at these morons and there may be some well, people who are absolutely. like yeah, yeah but that comment You're comes with like a dividing line across the table here Jim oh, yeah, yeah it's exactly. mostly us it, uh, yeah. no that's, <laughs> that's not what ha- that's not what I was implying um, but hey I just think this kind of stuff is good conversation like we said before it's the kind of conversation 
uh, that maybe we should have more of or we should be open to more of. And uh, so, I don't know, hit us up in the comments, and uh, you don't need to do that. I'm not going to – the thing is, sometimes we're like, hey, let us know, like, what you – I don't want to be like, let us know what you're doing to prepare for war. Um, probably, probably – Unless you want to let us know. Unless you yeah. do want to let us know. But, I mean, I hope you enjoyed this one. We had fun yeah. doing it. So. Yeah. yeah. It, it makes fun. you think. It's it a good yeah. exercise to make you think, you know? Yeah. So. Well, we'll see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. See ya. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.